Welcome back. You're watching Inside Politics. Thank you for staying with us. We continue with our roundtable discussions evaluating the week's top political developments. And we've just conversed clamor around the AUC chair position. Equally, we've taken a look at matters to do with the NADCO report. Right now, we want to shift focus to matters two-thirds gender rule. Even as President William Ruto rather, just last week affirmed the elusive two-thirds gender rule will be realized, saying it's not only constitutional, but it's also a moral imperative the country should achieve. He equally mentioned that his government has initiated radical strategies to actualize the gender parity rule, even as he pledged full support of a proposal that a male presidential candidate should have a female running mate and vice versa. Let's listen in. But let me encourage you that um, what the women governors are doing, they are doing more campaign than any campaign can be done. In the, jo in the, in the good job they are doing in their counties, they are not only inspiring other women to be leaders, but they are making it easier for the country to elect women the next time round. To increase the number of women governors from the current G7. It's not just a story. We're not just sitting here um, having this conversation and then going back to our homes. We have a strategy cut out for the next three years. Going forward, if a man is a candidate, for president in our party, the woman must be the runner. And, and if a woman is a candidate, then the, the man, a man can be a running. Okay, interesting. Um, president William Ruto just last week mentioning that. Right after Deputy President Rigathi Gashagwa, we don't have the bite, but he mentioned that is after 2027. So those <laughs> of you who are counting him out, he's still on the ballot and he'll still be assisting the president in his duties. In short, not verbatim, but that's what he mentioned. So uh, Bichachi, and this has been a long time coming, or rather let's start with Wakili this time round, because... <laughs> There's a couple of legal issues that stand in the way in terms of achieving two-thirds gender rule. Parliament, as we well know, does not fall under this bracket in terms of achieving that rule. Many have mentioned that perhaps we are our own biggest weakness, that at times Parliament fails to have, is it quorum, when such a bill is going to the House, that we shoot it down even before it gets to see the light of day. How do we actually actualize this? Because it's not just in Kenya. If that proposal goes through in the AU as well, we might have uh, to take a look at the gender <coughs> card in terms of such high key positions, briefly. Um, to start with, I think the truth that gender rule was enshrined in the Constitution in a bad way, I must say. Because it said that not more than two thirds of uh, the elective and you know important seats will go to more. I mean, to one gender. So knowing the way Kenyans vote, in any election, even if you were to come up with a way to fill in the gap, if Kenyans decided to vote for women only, then what would we do to fill in the gaps for the men? And if they decided to vote for men only, what would we do? There's a proposal. It's in Parliament right now. And of course, after Parliament, it has to go again through public participation. And after public, otherwise it will be declared unconstitutional. And then after public participation, then we see what happens next. But I feel it is the wording in the constitution that created this whole mess. There was that, I sat at Bombers of Kenya, I remember, Bombers 1, 2, and 3, at only 21, as the only observer on behalf of the youth in Kenya. And I can tell you that was one thing that people just said, okay, you want it in the constitution, put it. But we could tell the wording was wrong. And now that wording has caused us a lot of problems because now you are legislating around, actually the, 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 the easiest thing would have been to change the constitution to be worded differently. But in the what way- What would you have preferred it to be worded as? In any other form and state, but not the way it's worded because the way it's worded now, it just creates a calamity. Because it's like now you'd have to get to a place where you'd have to say that specific constituencies can only vote for a man and others can only vote for a woman to achieve that. So that, that did not make sense constitutionally. However, that's where we are. 
and given that that's where we are now, people have been trying to come up with formulas. And guess what? It's a very expensive provision right now because now uh, it looks the gap is 53 women at the National Assembly and at Senate is two. So now 53 times that salary of 1 million times that vehicles they get times whatever, whatever, you can see how much money we are looking at. But fair enough, let's have it. Let's put it there. Okay, okay. And uh, I am not fighting the need to have women in parliament. I'm just saying that we are creating another big disaster okay. and we are overrepresented anyway. Uh, Odoyo, as you come in, I'll have to go back in time and take a look at the president's awards when it comes to, you know, the women population in the country. In 2022, he signed a charter with women on post-election promises. I think we all remember what he had to say. He said half of his cabinet will be comprised of women. He went ahead and said he'll establish a woman's agency to deal with sexual harassment. He went ahead to say that his government will provide free sanitary towels to all girls. So looking at the political pronouncements that are made vis-a-vis -vis the actualizing, including the two-thirds gender rule, which he said this government will be intentional with it. Is it just big words with zero action? <laughs> I think some of the statements made by presidents, especially during campaigns, we must filter out the covenants, the promises, <laughs> the suggestions. We will say many things, especially when we are seeking votes. But there are those that are covenants we make with the people that we will do. Then there are those ones we don't give timelines. We will, but I can do it in the third year, fourth year, or even in the second term, depending on the cost of implementing them, the, the, the hardship in implementing them. Uh, but there is something in Kenya. Politicians seeking presidential position tend to do whatever the women want. Anything that women seem to really want, they say, let them have it. Even <laughs> this so-called gender rule, two-thirds, I quite agree with him. The way that was worded is almost impossible to implement. One time I had a very long discussion and a disagreement with the, uh, the Super North MP Milio Diambo on this. And I told her, you are in parliament. Give us a formula to implement it. Because you want it to be there. And this seemed to go against Article 27. Because it seems if you have to implement it properly, it will discriminate against men one way or the other. You must give them special seats or nominate them only. And one day, as he puts it, if one day something will make things change, mm -hmm. that now it is men, it is women who have voted, yeah. then what are we going to do? We are going to now start having men reps. So <laughs> I think we should have gone to, into this thing in such a way that we put things in the Constitution that encourage the election of women. Not that apparently one should declare it mandatory to have two-thirds elected. Then it is not an election. So we have to look for a way of rewarding that article in the Constitution. Okay, interesting. And just in a minute or so, your evaluation of the women governors so far, because we've had of President William Ruto, of course, mentioning that this encourages other women to join into the political <laughs> foray and whatnot. But in terms of Kuchapa Kazi, because we've had of so much praise and acclamation mm -hmm. going towards the women governors. Do you agree it, that perhaps, you know? No, it depends on the forum which politicians make statements. Okay. One time when I was a young man, President Moi came to Nyanza, uh, precisely Oma Bay. And he said they are going to have the Kanu headquarters in Oma Bay. Okay. And my brother, being a civil engineer, stood up and, 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 and found his way and, and asked him if he can get that job to design and have the architectural drawings and have the structural. He told him, but that's a political statement. He was a young man, he was 30 something then. That is a political, there are certain times when my audience are young girls, I make statements that favor them. I make statements that I would not, ordinarily not make if they were mixed slot or okay. if they were boys. Okay. Some of the statements we make because we are meeting only women are different from the one we'll make when we are meeting the all Kenyans. Nevertheless, uh, they are not lies, but they are expedient statements. They are statements that you make to please the audience you have at that point in time. <laughs> 
well put and the communication guy would definitely agree. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> but as you come in Bichachi, it's proper to note President William Ruto in his latest list of nominations actually included 10 female ambassadors and six deputies in recognition of women leadership in Kenya. One of them being Catherine Karemu who takes over from Manoa Esipisu in London. So now the political angle towards the whatever statement was made by President William Ruto. As I mentioned earlier, going forward, we'll see whether to, if the male is the presidential candidate, the woman should be the running mate and vice versa. I mentioned regarding Gashagua, mentioned that this is after 2027. So how do you look at it in terms of the ruling party, which is UDA, bringing this proposal into law within their party, that going forward, it will be this way? Yeah. I, I don't know why people like making Rigiji's life hard. <laughs> can, can the guy just deputize the president in peace? He's always in some form of trouble. But uh, that, that, that's on a light note. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, we, we must recognize that the issue of gender representation in this country is not just a political issue, it's a cultural issue as well. It is 2024. In many of our tribes, if there is dowry to be negotiated, the mother and the daughter who's being married is not present at those negotiations. So we must understand there is a cultural issue. Then there is the political nature of Kenyan politics. Okay. Kenyan politics is full of goons. Kenyan politics is full of ruffians. Kenyan politics is full of uh, people with the worst potty mouths possible. Kenyan politics does not lend itself to an environment that is conducive for women. So much so that if you read report after report of every election cycle, women will say they are abused more than men, they receive death threats, some of them have suffered sexual violence against them. So it is not just a matter of representation. Mm. There is a systemic and cultural problem in this country that does not lend itself to women participating equally in the political space. Okay? Number two, there is the question of is our parliament most specifically and our county assemblies are they democratic institutions or are they institutions of appointment for example if we say we go down down the route that uh, the senate went where you say you've got 47 senators and then all of them are men so then you have to appoint another 20 women not voted for even by women themselves. Subconsciously, what you're doing is you're giving the men in charge of those parties more power over women because they are taking the decision away from the women, and now they select who? We've had it said, their girlfriends, their friends. Yeah. And at the same time, you are introducing to uh, almost 30 percent of an electoral body of a sorry of a legislative body and introducing 20 people who are not elected by the people you see so the issue here has to be handled delicately and it's a shame that i'm a man speaking about this i wish it was a woman saying this what really needs to happen at the core is we need to make it possible okay. for women to run for office on the same footing as men. That's really the solution. Okay. It cannot be appointments because, again, if we go down the route where we are saying that we are going to appoint women, then political parties will just say, let men run. Then when the elections come, we've got more people to, to reward. Appoint. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, we need to be very tactical. It's not just about getting two-thirds. Mm. It's getting two-thirds in okay. a democratic way. Okay. And yes. also the spirit of it is changing the culture of Kenya.
that we understand and respect that women can lead, that women are smart, that women are capable, and just because a woman is standing does not give men then the right to belittle them, to ask them, where is your husband, to ask them, you unapiga kelele, wanawake wanafakwa in the kitchen. That is the real issue we need to solve. Well put, well put, Pichachi. And equally, back at home, feel free to give us your take. Our numbers are on your screens right now. We'll be taking short uh, calls shortly. But before we do that, I just want to cross over to my colleague, Emmanuel Tor, who will be breaking down what we should expect in the coming week in terms of those political developments that are set to play out. One of them, too, I understand, happens to touch on the Kisi deputy governor who was impeached. Senate is set to canvass that particular case on plenary. What more do you have for us, though? Well, thank you very much, Jesse. And of course, as you have already rightly put it, uh, we expect a lot of activities that will be forming the part and uh, parcel of what the, we expect in the political landscape this week. One of them, as we just have, as you've already mentioned, is the AU Special Executive Council meeting that is expected to make a determination on that uh, proposal to have the next chairperson of the AUC to be a woman, uh, which will be tabled on the 15th, which is Friday, uh, when the Executive Council meeting sits. It is uh, the Executive Council is the, is, the, is, the, is composed of foreign affairs ministers uh, from the AU member states, and uh, that means a uh, Prime Minister or Prime Cabinet Secretary, rather, uh, Musalim Devad will be uh, heading there because he's in charge of our diaspora and foreign affairs docket. So that will be part of the discussions this week. Something else that will be taking place this week is the Kisi Deputy Governor impeachment, where Kisi Deputy Governor Dr. Robert Monda uh, will be defending himself on the floor of the Senate on Wednesday and Thursday uh, because he's facing some charges uh, involving uh, abuse of office, crimes under national laws, gross misconduct, gross violation of the Constitution, and so many others that uh, were brought forward by uh, the MCAs who impeached him, I think, uh, almost uh, two, uh, a week and, and a half ago, and that will be forming that part. Something else that will be happening is President William Ruto will be meeting uh, Kenya Kwanzaa MCAs at State House Nairobi. This is a meeting uh, that has been long overdue. Some of those MCAs had complained during uh, the Kenya Kwanzaa meeting that happened last year, saying that they've never gotten a chance to speak to the president and table their issues. And so top of the agenda will be the World Development Fund that they've been working for and, and, and asking the president to institutionalize it. And this is part of the National Dialogue Committee report, as we had already mentioned uh, in, uh, in, our, in, in our other report and also party elections that will be coming in April will be part and parcel of that discussion. And uh, something that is also critical this week is the timelines uh, for the Joint Committee of the National Assembly's Justice and Legal Affairs, uh, JLAC, and as well as that team uh, from Senate, which is the Senate Standing Committee on Justice, Legal Affairs and Human Rights will have less than 40 days to finalize their nine bills given to them and report back to the House. Remember, uh, they were supposed to have 45 days to deal with those nine bills, some of which are constit constitutional amendment bills uh, that will be part and parcel of that report. If passed, there are so many things that will change. And so that will be very critical this week, Jesse. Okay, Tor, thanks for that update. Definitely a busy week lying ahead. And of course, the political desk right here will keep us abreast on the latest developments, even as we anticipate those issues that Tor has highlighted. Uh, gentlemen, before we take that short break, uh, we'll just go around. Uh, perhaps you can add your voice to what Tor has just mentioned. But equally, talk to us about the appointments we've seen so far. Amongst the list of appointments made by Ruto, six happened to be fronted for the CAS's position. They found a softer landing in terms of ambassadorial appointments here and there. Uh, you could converse that as well. Let's start uh, with you. Uh, thank you. As we go there, there's one thing that we were discussing and Mark Pichachi kept shying away from it. It was the, 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 the position that Rigi G is finding himself in because in every other conversation, he's, he keeps affirming his position as the, the running mate for President William Ruto. You remember even he told the women that's after 2027 because he feels as if there is a new plan now to have a woman, a woman as a running mate for President William Ruto in 2027. Mm. And mine is to encourage him and to tell him that uh, Rigi G, um, your time is coming in 2027 and you need to prepare for either. There's a very high likelihood that yes, 
uh, to be Mudavadi. There's also another likelihood that it will be a woman, a deputy president. He needs to know that he's in a party where he is just a member. He joined a party that belongs to other people and it has its owners. And President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta kept telling them, if you are going to bargain in politics, go with something. Go with your own party, go, and now they've learned the hard way. I mean, there are so many Mount Kenya MPs, and you've seen what they're doing right now. Avocados are at an all-time high. In fact, they are being given to dogs within Moranga. And now they are complaining and saying, wait a minute, even our most learned MPs, and I was talking to Honorable Moreu because he's my friend and he's an advocate, and I was telling even you when you were passing the finance bill, you didn't know that avocados are being taxed. And now there's word on the street that uh, there is no new tax for tea, there's no new tax for maize, there's no new tax for mursik. There's no new tax for fish, but there's new tax for avocado and products coming from Mount Kenya. Then, then tell so we me really this. have to be is, careful. Is it right for members of parliament to change their mind after voting in favor of a certain bill? Because we've seen them, they yeah. were there voting, but uh, after you, you should read shouting today's, from the loudest. You should read today's standard uh -huh. on page 11, Briefly. where parliamentarians, after passing the house, I mean, uh, the bills and knowing that it is very expensive, yeah. they have gone ahead to allocate themselves $2 billion to cushion themselves from the taxes that they meted on other Kenyans. That's, those are the kind of people okay. we are dealing with. Okay. We need to take a short break. Remember, we want to hear from you back at home. Feel free to call in the lines which are on your screens and we'll definitely sample some of the SMSs you've sent as well. Allow us to take a short break. When we come back, we sample your calls back at home and give us your input in terms of the day's top topics. Do stay.